Thank you for that introduction. I'm Natalie Haig and I'm currently the Head of Tech and Innovation for Inspired Women Lead. Now, if you ever meet me outside of a, a work environment, um, maybe hiking in the forest or, or in a pub or on stage, um, I'm usually the loudest. I might be singing, I might be dancing, I could be in pantomime. Most people don't immediately guess that technology is the industry that I work in. Um, it's not necessarily what you expect. Um, however, I decided I wanted to go into technology when I was 13. I decided this is going to be the career path for me. Um, and I'm being brutally honest here. It was the money. The money was was the appeal. Uh, come from a, a family that didn't have a lot of money growing up. My dad lost his job when we were early teenagers. And I decided as the oldest of three girls that I was going to bring in the money. And at the time in the early 90s, computers were just starting to be a thing. They were turning up in people's houses. They were starting to have a, uh, turn up in people's offices. And I was told that a computer engineer would earn a lot of money. So I thought, can't be that hard. Let's try it. Um, so that's what that's what drew me to technology, if I'm being completely honest. So now the question is, after 25 years of working in this industry, why do I want to stay in tech? And after having a career break from 2019 until last year, why did I go back? And the answer is different. It's no longer about the money. It's actually a lot of fun to be in the technology industry. It's really fast moving. You can have a really big impact, uh, even in some small places. Um, you get a lot of freedom because not everyone, we're, we're inventing stuff all the time. And so there's, there's lots of opportunity to kind of go your own way and think in your own way. And and you can make a contribution um, and you can change things, which is, which is incredibly fun. Um, so, you know, who suits technology? Well, I mean, in my opinion, I think it should be open to everybody. Um, some people say that it's about problem solving, helping people and being creative. I t totally believe that. Some people think it's about control, discipline, being accurate and managing data. It is also all of those things. I think that people in tech need to have many different skills, come from different backgrounds and have different approaches. And because at the end of the day, technology is in pretty much everything we touch now, um, not just in the Western world, but in the developing worlds as well. And if we don't design that tech to be useful and used by all of us, then it won't help all of us. So it's really important that everybody has the opportunity to become part of te the tech tapestry. So a little bit about my background, my education. Um, I'm actually from Kent, so I'm local, although I don't live here now. Um, I went to Victor Girls Grammar School, uh, studied maths, sociology and theatre studies. I'm sure you'll agree a classic combination. Um, can't tell you how many teachers advised me against it, but I was resolute that that was my choice. And actually, I think that that's sort of stood me in good stead. Um, maths, you know, no one can argue with maths being a, you know, a, a smart person subject. Um, sociology taught me about the world and theatre studies gave me the confidence to present myself um, and to present arguments better. There's also a lot of history in theatre studies as well, which people don't realise. And I went on to university at Royal Holloway and studied management information systems. 50% is, is computer science. Now, I, uh, I was not a natural fit to the computer science unit. I remember the first few weeks there, I used to turn up um, with, you know, my brightly coloured hair and my rucksack and um, probably Doc Martens and... Um, be told that I was probably in the wrong building and that history was that way and drama was that way. Um, being one of five women in a, a lecture hall of another 120 men, so being in the 4% was sometimes challenging. It was also really interesting. Um, so there were moments where I found being in the minority difficult and there were moments where it was an advantage. And I think that that's an interesting way to look at it. So right now, although I was 4% when I was at university, there are now 26% of people who are working technology are women. Now, this is data from last year. It might be even in more now. Now, what's interesting about this is that some of the highest paid jobs are in technology. So a figure like this does contribute to the, the gender pay gap, which I'm sure people have told you about. Um, but I'm not going to get political. Um, but I am going to tell you that tech can be tough. 
Uh, and tech was hard when I started. So I started in around about 2000, about the millennial. Um, Google wasn't there yet. It was it was being developed. It wasn't public use. LinkedIn, Facebook didn't exist, you know, let alone TikTok and YouTube, etc. So in order to learn anything, you had to get a textbook, you know, you had to and, and often the libraries didn't have the textbooks. You had to go and buy this big textbook. Now, when I was a uh, first uh, database engineer for um, for a SAP project, which is a, a big database company in the UK, I um, I had a, a textbook which was literally databases for dummies in my top drawer in my office. And it had to stay in my top drawer because I didn't want anyone to know that I was looking up the, the things that I needed to, to learn, even though as I got older, I realized that nobody knew what they were doing. We were all just muddling along and learning as we go. So in the beginning, it was it was hard. It's much easier now. There's a huge amount of um, tools and technologies and everybody writing really good tutorials online. YouTube is your friend. Things are a lot more user friendly now, I would say. Um, so just a little bit of background of my career. As I say, I started in around about 2000. I was a database consultant. I got to to travel to Switzerland uh, during the last year of my university. So that was really interesting. Um, just testing the waters of what being a consultant was like. Um, I decided that that was a little bit tough for me. Um, not um, not the right kind of um, team that I wanted to work in. So I decided to kind of go for a corporate instead. And I was accepted into Procter & Gamble in 2001 as a systems analyst. Uh, three years later, I was promoted to systems manager where I worked in a manufacturing plant in Germany. They made perfume that goes into ferry washing up liquid and um, washing powders. So very glamorous. <laughs> um, spent a lot of time coming home smelling like washing powder. Uh, but I suppose you could smell of worse things. Um, I left in 2005 um, after four years in a big corporate um, where I'd lived uh, in the UK near London and in Germany. And in 2006, um, I met and started a company with my now husband uh, of software development. So we had this idea that we were going to write software for other people based on our experience. He was uh, working for the mobile phone industry and I'd come out of corporate innovations in corporate manufacturing. So we said, you know what, we're quite clever. Let's go write software for other companies. And we did that for 14, 15 years. Um, and I was managing director, so I had to do lots of other things despite uh, just besides the tech work I was doing. So I got to do lots of accounting, lots of sales, you know, kind of fingers in lots of pies, basically. And, and that was kind of interesting. Um, and then in 2019, unfortunately, I became quite unwell um, and I had to take a career break. Um, so the unwell, there's a number of reasons for me being unwell. Partly it was stress of work and I ended up going into mental health hospital for nearly a year and then COVID happened. So that was a, a time to just take a step back and not rush back into any work. So I've taken sort of two, three years out just to resettle. I've done lots of voluntary work. And um, this year I was asked if I wanted to step up and become the head of tech and innovation for um, a global nonprofit called Inspired Women Lead, which I'm currently doing on a voluntary basis. And um, I'm absolutely loving being being back directly in tech, actually. So one thing I learned on my journey uh, in lots of different types of roles, so as I say, being an entrepreneur, but also being in, in a big corporate is that the times that were really hard and the things that I got wrong was when I was trying to behave in a way that wasn't natural to me, if that makes sense. So if I thought that a software engineer needed to be a certain way and I tried to be that way, I just didn't quite get it right. As soon as I started to approach problems in the way that I thought they should be approached or the natural using my natural skill set, that's when I made real traction. That's when I made a real difference. And, and that's what I would advise you to do too. Don't try and be somebody else. Try and be you, even if you're, the role that you're doing doesn't seem to suit your style, you will find a way through it. So what would I say my recipe for success is in tech? I think it's these five things. The technology is about being curious. 
you know, wanting to learn more, having that hunger for success and the thirst for knowledge. So you're always wanting to know a bit more. I and mean, I t- can't tell you the amount of hours I spend on YouTube just researching things or Googling. How's the, what's the best? Uh, we're working with Salesforce at the moment, which is another database um, for the Inspired Women Lead project. And I'm always thinking, oh, I wonder if I could put a photo on this report or I could change this. And so I'm spending a lot of time. You spend a lot of time researching. You just want to improve things. Um, and again, willingness to fail. Just try something, experiment with things. And if it doesn't work, great, you've learned something and keep trying until you get it right. Uh, and I think those sort of five things are stand you in good stead in pretty much any tech role. So if I would could say I had a wish for everyone in this room, whether you want to work in technology or digital, wherever, wherever you end up being, is that my wish is that you end up having a job where you enjoy coming to work every day. You get to work on what matters to you. You're able to use and improve your best skills and you can choose what you work on. So some things that I've learned during my journey or some things that people have told me. Uh, now the first one might sound a little bit harsh with someone who says, comes to you, especially if your husband says, you will not change the world. And that's a hard one for me to take. Actually, I always wanted to make a massive difference. I've always wanted to have an impact. And the, the sentiment of you won't change the world is not that you won't make any impact on anybody's life or that you won't improve something or have a contribution. It's just set your sights realistic because if you think you're going to change the entire world you will constantly be unsatisfied and demotivated and I think that's really important as I set set your goals realistic um, and then step by step if you check you can change the world one person at a time and that is really important to recognize that the other thing is don't expect to find the perfect job whether it's the first job the fifth job the sixth job the 27th job, you know, human beings like technology, technology don't stay still. You're going to grow, you're going to change. Um, and what is required in a job and the technology that's available and the kind of jobs that exist are going to exist in five years time and not the same as exist today. And so it's about being flexible and it's about taking a really good measure of the things that are really important to you, your values, and looking for something that has the best match. Because if you want to hunt down the perfect job, the one that allows you to use your laptop while sitting on the beach, you might spend a really long time looking and and you could be out there earning money, learning skills, building your network. So don't hold off getting a job, get in there, start doing stuff, start learning, start building your connections and and start growing your skill set. And then you'll find your path. So the other thing is again, find and nurture your strengths. So everybody is unique. Everybody has a unique set of um, skills. Now, um, I heard recently that being a more rounded person doesn't make you better at your job. Actually, the people who have understood the things that they're really good at um, and really worked on improving their strengths rather than trying to bring up their weaknesses to the same level are often better because they can leverage leverage those strengths. So if you're really, really good at data, really, really detailed, love accuracy, lean into that and go into something like data science. You know, if you're a visionary, then go into something where it's a field like um, health tech or um, fintech, where we need people who are coming up with better ideas or go into AI and try and understand new ways of using this new technology. And there's lots of different examples of that. Now, I really think that your individual brilliance lies in recognizing, accepting and leveraging your unique strengths, allows you to make the maximum contribution towards your purpose and transforming the world. Now that might sound really wishy-washy, but everyone, I think, every human being wants to make a difference in some way, wants to feel that they, the, the fact that they have spent time doing a role has been important. So when I was working for Procter & Gamble and I was um, working in Germany, some of the parts of my role were very um, litigious, I suppose. They were a lot about compliance, so a lot about legal things and GDPR and lots of report writing, and it's not my skill set. And I said to my boss one day, "I, I really feel demotivated because somebody else could be doing this and I'm not using my strengths, which is, motivating other people, um, coming up with new ideas, 
driving projects, initiating um, new possibilities. I'm filling in forms and I'm making Excel spreadsheets look prettier. And so I really felt that as a challenge and it really it really demotivated me and it made me hard hard sometimes for me to go to work um which is a real shame because if my boss had listened to me at the point i probably wouldn't have left so as an exercise you can do don't do it now you can do it when you get back is um try and find out what your strengths are so you can ask th uh, three of your friends uh, to describe you in three words give them a few attempts and then take those words and then you pick your favorite three and these are your characteristics so this is an exercise we do in inspired women women lead to help people find find their characteristics um, and it gives you somewhere to start thinking about your strengths um, there is also um, a lot of other ways that you can do it there's a thing called strength finder there's a number of other tools online um, the, and Myers-Briggs and other things like that that will allow, enable you to kind of locate things that you're good at so that you can start looking for roles that match those strengths. So where is technology? Well, pretty much every every office, every house. Um, you know, I do a lot of work with um, co personal coaches. So there'll be life coaches, there'll be co um, career coaches. And so that's all about face-to-face -face or video talking but they still use technology. They'll use it to organize their appointments, to appointment booking systems, they'll analyze people's behavior, they'll store data, they'll make decisions. They might even use AI to write their reports. So tech is really encroaching in absolutely every area of our lives, you know, even sport. So your future in technology. Your road to success, start with your strengths. And then start to build your vision. Like, where do you want to be in five years time, 10 years time, 20 years time? And these might seem like quite frightening questions. And you don't have to know exactly what mountain you're going to be on. But maybe having a direction or you want to help people do better things with their money. You want to help people in education. You want to help people in a particular country. You want um, to be pro something. So these are things that could fit into your into vision. So when you know where you kind of want to be or what you're passionate about then you can design a learning plan now a learning plan isn't just I'm going to take all these courses it can also be I'm going to take a role that has this in it for example I want to do something with data I'm going to take like a data analyst role or I'm going to go into some kind of um, uh, Google Analytics or marketing role just so I can learn the technology behind this and can I get practice with that and so they're the kind of things when you start thinking about what do I want to learn? Do I want to shadow someone? Do I want to get an apprenticeship in a particular company? Do I know someone in my network or can I meet somebody who's doing this role and I can understand what skills I need? You know, how do I get better at, for me, it's like, how do you get better at learning things? How do you get better at research? How do you take the shortcuts? So I have a big network of technical people that are way more smarter than me. And that's perfect because if I want to know something, then I will usually know who knows and then once you've got those ideas you can start to create your path you know and your path won't be linear and that's that's great because